so so thank you. Uh, we are now recording. Um, so again, um, my name is Jeff Gumis, and I am here today to walk through with you a number of free, I want to say that up front, everything that we uh, share today, these are free tools um, that you can be using to begin uh, continuing sort of education with your learners. As we know, most of you are in a distance learning environment. I do want to stop. I, I did this at the start of the last one. Uh, Carla or Kevin, um, do uh, either of you want to say anything before we dive in? I wouldn't. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I just want to tell everyone, thank you for joining us today. We are very excited about being able to offer this webinar with you. Uh, Jeff had been scheduled to attend our conference and was, was unable to do so. And so we uh, feel very fortunate that we're able to leverage his talent and all of his resources today. So again, we thank you for your time and we hope that everyone is well. Thank you, Jeff. Great. Thank you. Um, so you can see me now. I am going to actually uh, hide my video or stop my video. Um, and just as lessons learned and things that we know, if you're considering using a conferencing tool um, such as Zoom to provide sort of options for your learners to get together, um, it is a bandwidth uh, sort of issue for some folks because the video can take a lot of bandwidth. So you always have the ability to um, have your video on or not or not as a presenter. I'm going to talk to you a, a lot about Zoom this morning because that is the tool that we're using um, for this. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, and I do see some things uh, already happening in the chat window. So before we even dive in, I want to give you an overview of the controls that you have access to in your Zoom window because those are going to be important for how we manage uh, the questions that you ask uh, and or the information that you share. So um, what you're looking at right now is a sample screen of what someone would see on Zoom. On the bottom bar, you have the ability to adjust your audio settings. Now again, I'm going to sort of over explain some things because you may very well be considering using Zoom with your learners because Zoom is always free for a very uh, specific version of 40 minute meetings or less. But right now, Zoom, um, the Zoom regular edition is free for anyone who has an instructor account, uh, email account. So you have access to Zoom as a free tool to be able to video conference with students in a manner such as this um, with some slight uh, differences that I'll go over in a second. But uh, one of the things you have here is your audio settings. So if you click on this, it will open up and, and list out the options that you have for audio. You have the option to join this uh, through the computer audio, which you have a good, if you have a good speaker and a good microphone, then that's great. Um, or you have the option to dial in <coughs> if you want to do that instead. Um, I tend to sometimes, if I'm not running a meeting and I am sort of in a meeting that maybe I'm just, I just sort of an FYI, it sounds interesting and I want to be able to, you know, just hear what's going on and maybe I'm doing work in the background. I'll tend to, to use my phone to dial in on those because that way, say I have to get up and go to the bathroom or do something like that, it's on my phone, I can get up and go do that and, and I'm not like tethered to my computer. So that's one thing that I want to mention in terms of your audio settings. Um, in terms of these buttons down here, raise your hand, uh, excuse me, Q&A is what we want you to be using if you have a question for me or for Carla or for Kevin. Carla and Kevin are in this webinar as panelists, so they see those questions as well. And so um, as I'm presenting, they're going to be pulling together those questions, and I'm going to be stopping at various points to ask them if there are any questions that they feel are pressing or should be answered right now. We are going to be uh, logging all of those questions, um, and so it's really important you put them there so we'll have them all in one place, and that will allow us in our follow-up emails and communications to make sure that we're answering as many or all of the questions that you have. Uh, raise your hand as a tool if you sort of want to just indicate um, you know, that you can. I can't shut this off, but I'd prefer you not use raise your hand. Um, just use the Q&A if you have a question, and we'll, we'll get to those questions in as timely a manner as possible. And then chat. Uh, sometimes people will want to use chat um, as the, the, the form of 
where people communicate uh, both their questions and their comments. <coughs> uh, that's a little less helpful when we have such a large group. This morning we had nearly 300 people. This afternoon right now I see the participant number and we're at 161 participants. So having any type of ability to have real conversation in the chat is a bit challenging. Um, however, if it's not a question you have for me, if it's say, oh, did, did anyone catch what he just said? Or can someone share that link again that he shared? Uh, go ahead and chat that because your fellow participants can chat within and then you can see, um, you know, you, you can be communicating amongst one another, those types of things. Or if I am demonstrating a tool and you just want to make a comment and say, hey, like I use that and my students love it. Go ahead and use the chat window for that if you want and then everyone will see that. Now within using the chat window, I do want to point out a couple things. Um, and what you're going to see me moving my cursor around in weird ways, that's because I have all these different windows open that I need to sort of get out of the way so that I can see what I'm looking at. Um, you can't see those windows, but I can. So this is the chat window and we are in Zoom webinar, which is a little different than Zoom meeting, which is what you would have access to. Zoom webinar is where you have the ability to do these very large uh, sort of um, presentations that it really is a one-way communication where I am presenting to you for the next two hours. When you're using Zoom meeting, um, the participants have a lot more controls. So they will be able to mute and unmute themselves. Um, they will be able to show their video if they want to show their video. Um, and you have the ability always to um, hide their video or, uh, or mute them or unmute them. If you've ever used Zoom in a meeting context, you're always going to have some person that has a barking dog in the background or forgets that you know, they're at work and there's people behind them talking and everyone can hear it through their speaker. Um, and so you, as the, the moderator of a Zoom meeting, as a teacher, um, always have the ability to mute your students. And presumably, you're not dealing with many more than, say, 20 students at a time or less. Um, and we'll get into sort of some of those things uh, in a bit. But one thing I want to point out about the chat is right here is where you see the chat log. And then down here is where you click to actually send a message. Now, right now on my screen cap that you see here, it says all panelists and attendees. <clears throat> what, what, when you log into a webinar by default, it does not have this set to all panelists and attendees. It just has it set to all panelists. So if you're sending a message right now in the chat, it's only going to me and Carla and Kevin. You have the ability to change that, click on this arrow and change it to, I think it's everyone, is what it says. Actually, let me see. Uh, yeah, everyone in meeting. And then once you do that, it's going to say all panelists and attendees. So again, just quick uh, debrief of what I just said. All questions through Q&A, please don't use the raise your hand. Um, and the chat, uh, only use that if it's sort of a, it's not like a big question for me, but maybe you missed something or you wanna ask a question, does anyone use this tool? Um, as I'm talking about this tool, that's perfectly good. And that will sort of all get logged here in the chat log, okay? So, title slide. Uh, this is what we're talking about, supporting student learning at a distance. <clears throat> so I wanna preface this as I did this morning with we are going to be walking through a whole bunch of tools um, and a bunch of different strategies to give you sort of this 30,000 foot overview of all the sort of moving pieces to be considered as you are trying to figure out how to continue uh, supporting your students and providing them with some continuity of learning as we are in this very uh, challenging time for everybody. Some of you, this is going to be easier than others. Some of you are already teaching with technology um, and using it either in class and out of class or both. For some of you, you are not using technology and this is completely sort of new space for you. Uh, across the board, this is going to be different, not just for you and how you're teaching, but especially for your students. And both you and your students are dealing with life right now. Um, so this is not assuming that in a week from now, you have everything up and going 
the way it was before we all had school closures. We understand that's not the case. Learners' priorities have shifted and your priorities and personal priorities and health priorities have shifted as well. So we understand those things. The goal is for you to learn about some things that you can be doing to inch by inch start hopefully getting learners back into a groove of learning from a distance. Um, the other thing that I stressed in the morning session and I'll stress here is as we talk about these things and look at these various tools and strategies, I want you to not just think about it from the standpoint of, okay, we need a Band-Aid right now, so I wanna think of the things that I can use in this moment while I'm in this weird situation. I want you to think about it from a mind's eye of, this is an opportunity for us to experiment, for me and my learners to experiment together, for me to see how these things work, and for me to think about, okay, yes, this is a distance sort of learning environment that I'm suddenly thrust into, but what of these things can I continue to learn and do even when we're back in a face-to-face -face environment where, yes, we have that face-to-face -face time, but I can be providing my students with more opportunities to engage in learning outside of the classroom. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of distance learning. And so uh, it's kind of, for me, based on what I do, a slight silver lining in this whole thing that teachers you know, are kind of being forced to have to learn these things. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing um, because you're just going to be gaining new skills and new experiences in teaching that will just make everyone better teachers and learners um, in the future. So I forgot to update the time slots here. Sorry about that. So um, we're in the process of talking about setup um, and that's almost done. Uh, then we're going to do a review of a landscape scan survey that Carla sent out last week. Um, the landscape scan, as, as we're doing for you to try to have figured out what this webinar session needs to be about, um, you need to think about that with your learners. So the landscape scan was intended for us to gain an understanding of where you're at with communicating with your students right now, of what technologies you're currently using with your learners, about what you sort of know um, in, a, in an estimate manner about your learners' digital skill levels and their access. And all of those things have been formulated into us thinking about what's the most appropriate things to be sharing with you today based on the realities of you, your learners, and your environments, and your, your current experiences um, with technology. We're not trying to throw a ton of new technologies at you that are going to be completely unusable because of learner access issues or because they're just not even close to things that uh, your learners or you have any experience using. We're trying to sort of level this um, so that these are easy to use tools that you can be implementing quickly. Um, and so after we just walk through that, because there were some really interesting learnings that we had from that review, uh, we are going to set up communicate, or talk about uh, tools that you can use to establish communication. <coughs> we're then going to um, spend a large chunk of time exploring content resources that you can be using and talking about strategies for using that. That's gonna be a bulk of our time. And then spend a little bit of time at the end thinking about strategies for both sharing out that content with learners as well as managing learning in terms of how do you point students to the, the resources that you want them to use or the activities that you want them to do? How do you track learner time, which has been a repeated question that we've heard um, and it's something that is kind of wild west right now, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the last few minutes, we'll talk about next steps. Um, we definitely plan to continue these sessions. We are going to be sending out a survey after this, after we look through and groom all of the questions that we've had from both sessions, because that's going to inform us in thinking about what are some of the things that we probably need to offer next, but again, trying to hear it from you first, we will send out a survey for you to provide feedback to let us know what are the things that you wanna learn how to do or learn more about right away so that we can get moving as quickly as possible. The tools that we're gonna be using today primarily are this Zoom, which is what we're uh, communicating in right now. Uh, Google Classroom is something that I'm, I'm going to lean heavily on for management because it is widely used both by K-12 educators and adult educators, but it's also just an incredibly useful tool for communicating and putting everything together in one place. 
And we're going to be using a tool called Wakelet for sharing, which I'm going to show you in a second. <clears throat> Along those lines from this morning's session, and this is a, just an interesting, again, sort of thing that we learned this morning. I was about 15 minutes into the presentation and I had Google Classroom up, which we had asked people to join in the email beforehand. And I was seeing all these messages saying, does anyone else have audio? Um, so the person thought that the, the webinar was being done through Google Classroom. And this is just, if we haven't used these tools before, this is a learning experience for all of us. So Google Classroom is a tool that allows you to send out assignments, to have chat threads, to um, basically manage class work within your a class that you create. Um, that is what it is. And, and you can have grading in there and you can have a reporting in there. And it's a great all-in-one tool for um, creating assignments, creating activities, and getting reporting on those activities and grading those activities. Zoom has nothing to do with that. Zoom is simply a communication tool. Um, so we are presenting right now through Zoom. You're going to be doing some activities uh, in Google Classroom, which is a management tool. And Wakelet is a tool that we're going to look at next that is a great way uh, for folks to share resources. So I have created a Wakelet uh, that I am going to share in the chat right now. I'm actually going to launch it, sorry. <coughs> and I'm going to share it with you in the chat right now. And one of the reasons that I really like Wakelet as a tool, which is free, uh, I will preface everything I say uh, with everything we share is free, is that Wakelet is a tool that allows you to create, and I'll go to my homepage first, various collections. These are weird titles because they're, uh, they're lower level readings that we've pulled together, but they allow you to do anything. I, put, I have a winter recipes Wakelet, so it's kind of Pinteresty where I just plop different recipes on there. But I have the ability to create those types of things for others, like this is a, for a digital literacy training that we do um, that provides a bunch of different digital literacy resources. Um, I've created lessons in Wakelet on key idea and details that pull together a reading and a Quizlet and other activities. And it's something that you can share with students just right away and then they immediately have access to. So I'm gonna go up to the one that I created for this so you can see uh, what it is. So first of all, this is what I've created on screen. I'm going to share it. <coughs> One of, uh, you can do a number of things that you might recognize some of these icons on here. I could tweet this if I wanted to, but I can share it with Facebook. I can share it in Google Classroom. I can share it with Remind, which is a communication app that we'll look at. And because I've integrated my Wakelet with that, it's automatically going to put me into those apps and allow me to create an assignment or to create a chat that says, hey, check out this Wakelet. So uh, the other thing that you'll see, and if you have your phone handy and you know how to use QR codes, um, if you're in a Zoom webinar environment, I can actually click on this thing and get a QR code that if you know how to use um, your QR code reader on your phone, you can just hold it up to the screen and then students and you would have it on your phone. But I'm gonna share this using the link that I have here. Um, and I am gonna paste that and send it to everybody in the chat. So if you haven't opened the chat window yet, please make sure you do because this is the link to the Wakelet. I'm gonna just type that in. Okay, so just scrolling down through this, I have pulled together a bunch of different resources. So in a second, we're going to walk through the process of joining Google Classroom. About 90% of the folks in this morning's were able to get in, so that's awesome, um, but some left not knowing how to do so. But this provides like more detailed instructions for people to go to afterwards. This is a link to launch Google Classroom, and then here are the steps again, and then here's a how-to article that we've provided. Um, the other thing that we have here is I've asked you to go ahead and open up the teacher tools page, um, which is something that we're using as a guide for all of the tools that we are gonna be talking about during today's session. So we're gonna look at some communication tools, we're gonna to look at some content resources, we're gonna look at um, supplemental content and quizzing tools, 
and classroom management and content management tools. Um, so all of these we're gonna sort of be hitting upon during today's session, but what's nice is I've provided you in one place all of the things that I'm gonna need you to access today. This is how you join Google Classroom. Here is the link to the teacher tools page that we're gonna be using. Uh, when you leave here today, here are three great websites that provide reviews of different uh, tech tools, as well as lists of the most popular technology tools used in education. Um, this also has a great video because I'm not gonna be going too in depth into like Zoom or Google Meet uh, or um, Skype uh, because we just don't have time for that. <clears throat> but this is a great video that was developed that shows the how-to of getting into a number of those tools. It's a 20-minute video, that's it, and the, for the educator who created this, um, she shows how to get into Google Meet, Google, excuse me, um, Uber Conference, Skype, and Zoom, both as a participant and as a host. So it provides a nice overview if you're considering using web conferencing tools with your student. Uh, students. Um, this then also gets into some guides that sort of touch upon the broader strokes of the content resources that we're going to be talking about today. And then um, there's a little quiz that I have at the end, which is just kind of, a, I'm throwing it in there because it's very timely, uh, which is another thing. So I don't know if teachers, or students, excuse me, care about angles right now when they want to know how to stay healthy. Um, so maybe one way to keep learners engaged is to provide them with regular opportunities to learn um, facts about what's going on uh, or to share and talk about or even write a, write a journal about how they're feeling or, or what's going on right now. So, um, you know, adult learning theory, we focus on sort of relevance to learners. I think right now uh, there's something front and center for everyone. Um, so that's an opportunity if you're feeling that learners aren't engaged right now to bring them in. Maybe you're using your class environment simply as a way to get learners together to talk about what's going on, what they're having any issues with, and, and be creative in terms of how you provide readings because there are tons of readings obviously on this topic right now. Um, and then I also have additional resources in this wakelet for you. So uh, the presentation that I'm gonna be hopping in and out of here is a link to that presentation. So uh, if you just click on this, it's gonna open it in Drive and then you can, um, you can open it, you can make a copy of it if you want uh, to have it for later, but it's always gonna be accessible to you here, as well as some articles and tools to help you with thinking about what the steps are to get going with distance learning. So this is Wakelet and it's a very powerful free tool that allows you to gather content. What I'm using it for here is just a set of resources. I'm gonna show you some other examples uh, later today where you could literally use it as a lesson builder um, and have a quiz or have a reading or have a video all in one place so that you don't have students going to a bunch of different links, which is really important, um, if you, particularly if you have not uh, taught in the distance environment before. So why are we using Google Classroom as the other tool? Um, as I said earlier, it's an all-in-one place for you to manage your assignments, your resources, and your communication, which is very helpful if you don't want to have to go and teach a bunch of different tools to your learners and don't want to have to learn a bunch of new tools yourself. <coughs> it also integrates with the Google suite of products, um, which helps deliver, uh, develop digital literacy skills. You could literally just post an assignment that says, write a paragraph about how your life has changed uh, in this current situation. And then you add a file and that is just a blank Google Doc. And that assignment will go to students and then students get their own copy of that doc, they write their paragraph, they submit that assignment and then you have all of those assignments in one place. When you click on any student, you can open up their doc, you can grade it and, and say how they did, you can provide comments in the doc, you can provide comments just on the grade. So you're teaching them how to use things like word processing skills. And I'm gonna show you an example of that um, when we get a little further in, where you, you can be teaching like both writing skills and digital literacy skills in the same place because you're using these tools. Um, G Suite is everywhere in terms of slides and sheets and, and docs, which are all um, productivity tools that are more and more being used in the workplace. Um, so you're, it's not a loss leader that maybe you're just having them you know, use Google Classroom to, to, to do different things like that. 
And then <clears throat> the other thing about Google Classroom is when we look at the content tools like Khan Academy, like CK12, um, a number of the tools that are really well, uh, well liked and well used within edu education um, that are content related, they have automatic integration into Google Classroom where you literally see the icon you see here on the right in there. And when you have a reading that you want to assign or a math video that you want to assign, you literally just click on the Google Classroom icon and it's going to put, pump that assignment into Google Classroom for you to assign with your learners. Um, so it really is a powerful tool um, that I highly recommend using. So. This is the code that was shared. I am going to um, put that in the chat so that you can copy paste it. KP5, it's I3, not 513. I'm gonna go through the motions of how to do to get set up if you haven't been set up. And I'm gonna go to the trusty wakelet that we created. So I'm gonna scroll here and you will see the steps that I provided is one, go to Google Classroom. <clears throat> now, this is going to bring you to this page, which is an informational page about Google Classroom. Now, I'm going to click on Go to Classroom. So, I am now in my uh, personal Google Classroom account. I have a personal and a professional one, um, and I'm just dabbling in different classes, but um, I now want to join this class that has the code CNKP, sorry, 5I3. So now that I'm in classroom, uh, you'll see that there's a plus sign up here, and that's how you join a class. So I'm going to be joining this class, and it's also where you would create a class as a teacher. So I'm going to paste that code. I didn't actually copy that. Um, I'm going to paste, copy paste that code, sorry, in here, and click join. And now what you're going to see is in a second, I am, I've now joined this class. Now, this is a class that has already been set up. So like this person, yeah, Kevin just put in a comment here. Um, this person here has said they're trying to get into class. Please um, join the Zoom meeting. And this person may or may not have already um, figured that out. But so you'll see that Google Classroom has a, uh, chat that you can sort of um, have this ongoing thread of communication with your students and your students can communicate as well. Now again, you in a classroom with your class, it's going to be like 15, 20 students, right? We have uh, 300 from this morning and we're at current count 183 this afternoon. So this is an unruly chat right now because there are so many people in it. However, um, you know, in a classroom environment or what you're, what you're doing today, um, or sort of in the future, excuse me, um, this is a great tool for having that sort of ongoing communication. There's a reason it looks like a social media feed because this is what our learners are using in terms of technology. And so one of the things we're gonna uh, emphasize, excuse me, today is focusing on tools and thinking about tools that your students are already using and trying to sort of mirror that in what you're doing as opposed to trying to overwhelm them with new things. So this is the class that we're going to be using. If you have questions about getting into this Google Classroom, please do put them into the Q&A. Carla and Kevin will hopefully be able to help you. Do not fear if you are unable to get into this class during today's webinar, that is okay. We'll troubleshoot with you after because I want to make sure you understand how to get in. Um, Everything that I do in Google Classroom during the next hour and a half, I will be pasting into the chat window as well. So every activity, every link, uh, we will make sure to put it into the chat window. Um, and I will dive into what this is later, but just as a quick overview, <coughs> I can see my classwork that I've created. I actually created an assignment that some students have already done from this morning, so which is just looking at a resource, and we will look at that. Um, in a second, I can go to all topics and see this is the only uh, assignment I've created. Um, I have that stream and then I can look at the people uh, who are in my class. So again, I have a ton of students in here uh, because this is both webinars combined, but because it's integrated with Google, it's very easy to communicate through Gmail um, to those students. 
Uh, and again, it's just nice that you can coordinate everything in one place. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water and I want everyone to know I am perfectly fine. Um, I have had a cough for like over a month. I have been to two doctors. It is not that, um, but it sure makes people concerned when you do cough anywhere. <laughs> um, so I am fine and I'm sorry if it's disruptive at any point today. So, we conducted a landscape scan. Now, I'm thinking most of you may have uh, probably did this survey. Um, these were separate. It didn't come, it didn't go just to say the registrants of the Zoom webinar. Um, it went out beforehand. Um, this landscape uh, scan survey, which we did in Google Forms, uh, was designed for us to really get an understanding of what is the reality happening right now, both in terms of how are you communicating with your students, uh, in the interim, but also uh, what do you know about your students' tech access and their digital skill levels, and what tools and resources are we already using with students? So again, trying to not say, hey, you've got to do all of these different things. Let's think practically. If you're using a chat tool like Remind already, or if your students are already using email, then let's keep keep going with that for, for at least the short term. And then if you want to, to, to get sort of consistency and establish that, and then if you want to start video conferencing or using tools like that, um, sort of eke your way into those as you get more comfortable and into sort of a regular consistent chain of communication. And then obviously we wanted to learn about what tools folks are aware of. <clears throat> this is twofold. Um, we want to focus on the things that are going to be used, uh, most importantly, but as we have no idea how long we're going to be in this setting, and uh, I am not an expert on every single tool that is out there, I can sort of talk uh, um, sort of sensibly about all, many of them. Um, we wanna know of you who is actively using tools like Reminder, who is actively using something like Khan Academy, because down the road, it may very well be in this scenario or even afterwards, that we want to start making more connections amongst teachers to say, hey, here's a set of teachers that really are active users of this tool. These are people that you can contact if you have questions on how to use them, or this is how we can design trainings and call on those people to go into deeper dives on some of the tools that we're going to talk about today from the actual standpoint of an instructor who is using that tool in the classroom. Um, so the survey results. Uh, this one was just to get a sense of, of who, who's, who we're talking with. Um, so three quarters of you almost are ABE teachers, um, and about a third of you are either uh, adult secondary education, which is high school equivalency, or ESL teachers. A um, handful of you are uh, transitions instructors, and a large handful, 44, and then 36 of you were career and technical um, instructors. So very important question up front. <clears throat> because obviously this is going to uh, sort of identify for you right out of the gate, what are the limitations uh, in terms of what I can be providing for my learners? A quick sort of story, uh, City of Philadelphia, um, because they became very well aware that most of their learners did not have access to internet connected computers at home, they are not doing any sort of online distance learning component. Everything is, is, is hard copy, packet based. Those are being mailed, those are being picked up as students are grabbing their lunches because they did not want to create just broad inequity across the district. So this is a really important thing to consider um, both in this distance learning environment, but even when you get back to class and maybe you decide you want to start using more tech tools, you want to be mindful of what your learners can and can't use both from a skill perspective, but also an access perspective. Um, so this is not surprising. What we see from this data here is when we're looking at um, the 50% or um, higher combined, we're looking at 47% uh, of you say that half or more of your learners have access to internet computer, internet connected computers. So what that means is more than half of your learners do not have access to internet connected computers. Um, and then we asked a question on access to smartphones. And again, this is not, this is not shocking to me um, because this is, seems to be a sort of standard across um, the country. But in looking at, again, these colors up here, uh, 
this is indicating that uh, almost around uh, 80 plus percent of learners uh, for, uh, of you, excuse me, indicated that at least half of your learners have access to smartphones. So that is the more widely um, or broader way in which uh, more learners are able to access the internet. Now within that, we know there's limitations in data plans and that's something that we're gonna talk about as well. In terms of digital skill levels, I did find this interesting. So most of you did not have about maybe 10, less than 10% um, indicated that your your learners are complete tech novices and an even smaller number of you said that you consider your learners to be advanced. Um, but it was an even split amongst basic. Basic means <coughs> that your learners uh, can use, and this we always hear a lot, they can use text messaging, they can use social media, but they really struggle if I try to introduce new technologies. Um, and, and that's an important thing to think about. So Remind, which I've mentioned a bunch of times now, is a texting tool. So if you know that that's the one thing that they're doing on their phone, or the one thing that they're comfortable with doing on their phone, and you can send a link to a video that you want them to watch, and then chat back to you what they learned, that's a win. Um, they, they have access to the internet through their device, they know how to text, they can click on a link in a text, they can watch the video, they can text you back. That is learning at a basic level, um, acknowledging what the learner's skill level is at this point in time. That's okay. Um, the re excuse me, the uh, yellow here was intermediate, and this is where um, my learners have foundational tech skills and can perform most basic functions. And with initial guidance from me and learning new tools, they are okay to operate independently with that tool. <clears throat> That's going to be different for you now. Um, so in a classroom environment where you are there to demonstrate things in front of them, to be able to troubleshoot with them at, in person is a lot different than trying to troubleshoot remotely. So you do need to consider that as you're trying to engage with new tools with your learners. Um, but again, so the, the goal is to try to keep things simple um, and to meet them where they are in terms of what they're used to. Uh, in terms of skills and access, a lot of these things are not surprises as well. Uh, ranging from learner motivation right now is, is either not there typically at home or definitely not there now that there's so many other things going on in their lives. Language barriers was one. Access to um, uh, both the internet and limitations in their data plans as well as proper hardware were also concerns that were mentioned a lot. And then in terms of the things that you use in, in, in terms of resources, um, lots of mentions made that they need to be user friendly and they need to be mobile friendly and they need to be consistent. <coughs> we saw a few complaints about tools that we know are used within the state of Georgia that are sort of paid uh, learning platforms that can be used that students complain that they can't access on their mobile device from home. And so again, considerations that we need to make in terms of the tools that you're sharing. One thing I wanted to point out regarding the access issue, um, Comcast, Comcast Internet Essentials, which normally is $9.95 for people who qualify uh, based on their economic status, um, they're offering that free for 60 days um, during this time period. <coughs> Everyone On is also a great resource for folks that um, is a website that provides location specific information both on discounted um, internet access, but also for discounted hardware. So you might wanna check that out. Uh, one point to make, in that wakelet, remember I provided you with the slides that we're looking at right now. Um, if, you were, if you open up those slides right now, all of the things that I have in here are hyperlinked for you to be able to directly access. So if you wanna, sorry, check out those things right now, you can. And then this is a link that I actually will pop out into <clears throat> I do not know the source of it, but um, this is being gathered. This is information for a wide range of offers being made by telecommunication companies across the country. Um, I don't know which ones are specifically Georgia or our companies, but you can scan and you'll be able to find um, the ones that you know are available in your state. But they're compiling this so that people can see um, and go to the direct links that provide information um, on, on whatever um, resource it is that, or excuse me, um, company is offering um, discounted internet right now in this time. 
Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out is uh, obviously in trying to use these new technology tools, uh, learners need to have the digital skills. So um, if you aren't familiar with uh, GCF Learn Free is one site that I would recommend in particular. It's listed on the teacher tools site that we're going to be going through in a second. However, um, Crowded Learning has created a digital skills library and that is linked uh, in your wakelet as well. Uh, we have a student home and a teacher home. The teacher home, <coughs> which I did not point out this morning, has uh, tools that you can provide learners for them to assess their levels. And I, I did see in the comments a number of you are using North Star Digital Literacy, which is a free digital literacy skills assessment. Um, I don't know if Georgia has a license, but uh, licenses allow you to actually do proctored versions of them. Again, you can't do that right now. But all of these assessments are free. Um, and students can take them and they do get a report at the end that says what they know how to do and what they um, need to work on. But uh, some other tools that are in here for teachers is uh, observation checklists, which are not going to obviously be available to you uh, to do right now because you're not going to be able to sit and observe your students. Um, but we do have a student self assessment. That's a Google form that you um, have the ability to make a copy of. There's instructions there to provide a copy, but this is a way for you to gather information from students. Again, if they can even do this, and I understand and acknowledge that that is a challenge, but Google Forms are very mobile friendly um, as well, and they can answer this survey about various skills in using email, using word processing, using slideshows, and you can delete these questions or add to them if you want, but this might be the type of thing that you want to send out to your students to just sort of get a landscape scan as we have done with you and understanding of what their skill levels are. So um, I'm seeing some comments from Kevin in the chat and I want to make sure, aha, okay. Uh, questions about Zoom, do, do, do these teachers all need to use all these resources we'll be using at the same time? <clears throat> okay, so the first question uh, that, that was shared, um, this has been shared uh, from the questions that you have. Um, I did get an answer that one, you do have a, a statewide license to North Star Digital Literacy. Um, and again, the link is here. It's, uh, you'll have that available, but if you're not using it, I encourage you to use it. Um, the statewide license, you're not going to be able to administer, again, exams right now, but you can share free assessments with students. Um, and so those are things that, that people could be doing if they want. The first question Kevin has, uh, or, or from you, excuse me, is um, some schools have decided to use uh, WebEx instead of Zoom. Um, I have no idea, this question that was asked is if Google Classroom is a management tool that can be used as a whiteboard or aqueous board, I don't even know what an aqueous board is through Zoom or WebEx. That I don't know, um, but one thing I have learned is I do have, and I've never used this, and you're, I'm learning right now. Um, aha, here we go. Um, so as I'm presenting uh, with you right now, I do have the ability to uh, draw, I think, on my screen. Um, so this is sort of a whiteboard environment. I'm almost positive in Zoom, there is a whiteboard tool. So I can do, um, you know, I can write through examples. I can uh, use this spotlight tool. Actually, I don't think I did just click on that spotlight tool. Here we go, um, where it will, you'll see sort of this uh, cursor, or I can change that spotlight tool to an arrow which allows me to more easily point out to things on screen, um, which could be helpful as you're showing students maybe how to navigate new resources. I know there's a whiteboard tool in here. I have never used it. Um, however, I will look into that. Um, in terms of it integrating, I, I, I think the difference between WebEx and Zoom, this was asked earlier, <coughs> isn't, there, there isn't really. I mean, uh, I think, for the most part, it has, they all have the same tools and you know, they, they all keep adding new tools as the other does. So you do have the ability to share your screen as I'm doing right now. You do have the ability to call in or use computer audio. You do have the ability to record your meetings and save them. 
Um, all of those tools exist. You do have the ability, as I'm doing right now, to share your screen as opposed to this being a video call where we're all looking at one another. And that's in Zoom and in WebEx. Um, Zoom has been more popular because it does, even in a non-corona world, have a free version that allows you to use it for free. Um, your limit is 40 minutes per call um, or per, per meeting. So that's a limitation. I was just on one this week where someone does use the free version and there's a little timer that's, that shows you your countdown as you're getting close, just so you know that the meeting might end. Um, but that's why I think a lot of schools prefer Zoom. <coughs> um, the next question is, some are using Remind, Khan Academy, Google Classroom, and WebEx. Do those teachers need to use all of these resources? Will they be using all of these things at the same time or will this overwhelm my students? I absolutely do not think that you should be throwing everything in the kitchen sink at your learners. Um, your goal coming out of today is to look through and think through the things that are shared and think about what are one or two things that I can start using with my students right now. And that may be just a stand up content that they can go to and learn independently, or that may be for you actually to want to start engaging in sort of real time teaching um, through something like uh, this uh, Zoom or one of the other platforms. So um, I do not recommend saying that tossing out uh, every single one of these things in the kitchen sink to learners is a great idea right now. So um, we're gonna talk about some of the things that uh, as teachers we need to think about as we're moving forward. So first things first, um, we're gonna look at communication tools. I'm not gonna do a deep dive uh, into how these things work because that would get really sort of unruly. <clears throat> Obviously, you're seeing right now how Zoom works. And I do want to, I said this earlier, but I just want to mention again, we are in a webinar. Uh, webinar is not something that you will be using. Um, maybe you would, but it's, it's a lot more expensive than Zoom meeting. And it really is intended for sort of one-way communication out to share or show information. It's not meant for uh, us to be communicating really back and forth. When you use Zoom meetings, uh, you literally, students will jump into the meeting. They can just call in if, if they, if they want to just call in, which is another important point. Um, maybe you're just using Zoom because you want to have a conference call. You're not going to necessarily use Zoom to show anything um, or for, and, for, and or for those students who want to go into the video call, they can use the video and see it. Um, or you may want to use it as I'm using it now to actually be sharing your screen, sharing content, sharing how to do things. Um, but in Zoom meetings, when learners join, they have audio. They have the ability to show themselves on the camera or, or hide their camera. Um, you have the ability to mute them all. So um, that's like the environment we're working in now is, is Zoom, but it's slightly different because it's a webinar, but it is just like a big conference call um, if you're using Zoom meetings. So the one question we asked up front was how regularly are you communicating with your learners? Most of you are, have established at least communicating at least once a week. Um, some are, are, are not yet uh, or haven't even done anything at this point. Again, that's completely understandable. We know this sort of came across everyone suddenly. In terms of the modes of communication that are being used, <coughs> some of you already are using video calls and conferencing tools like Zoom. A majority of you are using email. That was about 72%. And a number of you are using messaging tools. Uh, again, Remind was the one that was most commonly mentioned. And I will, I made the point earlier today, um, I did not know about Remind until two years ago when I presented at your fall conference in Georgia where I saw a number of teachers were using it. So um, it's a great tool. Again, using something that students are familiar with and more apt to actually respond to. They're used to texting. They're not necessarily used to emailing. Um, the other mode of communication, yes, that thing is a phone where you actually make phone calls. 63% um, of folks said that that's how they're maintaining communication with their learners. I want to say right now, it is highly likely you will be using all or at least multiple ones of these um, in this current context. Uh, it is the reality that you just might not be able to get folks set up in video conferencing tools, and that is okay. Um, there are other ways to communicate out assignments to them. 
Um, so one or more of these is likely going to be what you are using um, both now in this situation, but in the future. <coughs> in terms of your familiarity, most the most commonly used or tried um, tool was Skype. Um, Zoom, some of you had familiarity with. Uber Conference, which is actually also free, um, and it's along the lines of Zoom more so than Google Hangouts or Google Meet um, or even Skype. Um, most of you had not heard of, but that's okay. We won't focus on that. Um, we'll focus on Zoom. We'll focus on some of these other tools. Um, within this, I'm going to hop over to, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Now you're seeing my screen and I need to pop back over here. Sorry about that. I have to escape. <coughs> On the teacher tools page, um, I do want to look at these sort of in, in one spot. So Zoom is what you're using. Skype has probably been around longer than any of these. This was kind of the original, hey, wow, we can make phone calls on a computer and there can be video. And it was often used for people to, instead of using long distance, they could actually Skype on their computer and then on their devices when devices came around. Um, you can also use it internationally. Skype uh, can be used for one-on-one -on -one communication and that's like sort of immediate phone calls uh, or it can be used for setting up group phone calls as well. So it's a, it's a little bit more immediate in terms of how you might want to communicate with students, as is Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts is literally something um, that if you're in your Gmail, you have a chat, a chat window and you can click. I would say Google Hangouts is something that you're going to use more if you use it for one-on-one -on -one communication um, that has video. Um, it is not necessarily something that is very user-friendly if you want to do large group meetings. Google Hangouts Meet is a newer tool that does allow for sort of more broad meetings. Um, that you can set up with your students, that you can integrate and put into a calendar event that you share with students um, so that that link is in there and that they can join. And then Uber Conference is the other one that I mentioned. Um, again, we're not going to dive too deep into these, but in your Wakelet, and I'll show you it in a second, is a video that provides an overview of a number of these tools. Familiarity with messaging tools. Again, I've mentioned Remind is something that's commonly used. Some of you have set up Facebook groups. So again, we hear learners are on social media. So if you haven't done this before, maybe set up a private group in Facebook for your class. So then they can be using Facebook and communicating through Facebook um, in that private group that nobody else has access to, to communicate things. You can create events in Facebook and then those get shared with that group. So again, meet learners where they are. Slack, don't worry about it. Clearly you've never heard of it. It's something that's used predominantly in business, but it is a very popular tool. WhatsApp is the other communication tool uh, for messaging that was mentioned. Uh, WhatsApp is owned by Facebook, but this kind of like Skype became popular very early on because it allowed for, it was one of the first tools that allowed for texting that um, you could do through Wi-Fi and it wasn't using your data, excuse me, your SMS data. Remember when you had to pay for texts? Um, <clears throat> so WhatsApp was a internet-based uh, um, messaging tool instead of having to use your, um, your, your wireless plan. Um, and it's very popular for folks when they travel abroad or for students who have family in other countries. WhatsApp tends to be their go-to because, again, it's, it's not um, usage is a little different because it's internet-based. When you're thinking about communication, you need to really first think about what are your goals. Um, do you want to sort of keep class going as it was? Do you think you're going to get to a point where you're literally having a one o'clock class every day and everyone's there? Um, or is your goal more to just be able to communicate out? Here are resources you can do. Here's something I'd like you to work on this week. Please submit it by the end of the week. Um, and that goes, I should have reordered those bullet points, but uh, the last bullet point is how much of your instruction do you feel must be synchronous? What we are doing right now is synchronous. It's face-to-face, -face, it's in real time. It's great, but it requires Zoom, it requires video, that's a bandwidth issue, and if I wanna be showing things, some of your learners aren't gonna be able to access the video. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do that, um, but you need to think about that. Versus asynchronous, where, where you might create a Google site and just provide your weekly assignments or do it through Google Classroom. 
and then you just say, hey, I want this by Friday. Use chat when you want. The whole beauty of distance learning is that not everybody has to be in the same place at the same time. So for those things that you feel comfortable with, having students just work on and you don't need to be teaching in order to do it, um, maybe that's going to be more of the cadence that you establish with your learners. And then obviously, again, what tools are you and your students already using? Uh, back to the synchronous versus asynchronous, I have had two teachers in Illinois that I work with and as part of this Illinois Digital Learning Lab. One, because all of her students have Chromebooks, because she was already using Burlington English and Google Classroom, she has been able to add in Zoom and maintain her Tuesday, Thursday class, which is a three hour class. Now she's not Zooming for three hours, those are just one hour meetings, but her mindset was I wanna just keep things going in as consistent a manner as they already were for those students that are able to continue doing that. <clears throat> I've had other students, or excuse me, teachers that are using Zoom not as a, hey, we all have to meet today, but hey, during these days on these hours, I'm gonna have Zoom open, or this is where an area where you might use Google Hangouts because you can just provide a link and then students can hop in if they want. And they're calling it open office hours. So that just provides opportunities for students if they can and they're so inclined to hop in to ask questions, maybe just to commiserate about what's going on in their lives. Um, so you, know, you just need to think about what it is you're trying to do with communication. In that wakelet that you have access to, and here it's linked, this is a 20 minute video uh, done by an adult educator in Rhode Island that provides a great overview of Google Meet, of Zoom, of Skype, and of Uber Conference. Uh, 20 minutes, and she gets into it both from the uh, participant perspective in terms of joining, as well as from the host perspective in terms of setting up and starting the meeting. So it's a great video if you're interested in using this these tools because it provides a nice overview. Um, a warning for you, it is not going to be seamless. I am sharing this video in this presentation. We will not watch it. <coughs> However, uh, Monday I had a, I tried to host a video uh, birthday party for my cousin. Uh, we had a bunch of cousins on and my aunt and uncle, his parents who are both in their 70s. They were able to get into the Zoom um, and see us, but they could not get the audio to work. Uh, if you care to look at this video, it is quite funny. Uh, trying to get them to understand how to join audio through their computer and then ultimately trying to get them on their iPad and then ultimately going, okay, you can just dial in, uh, was about a 15 minute exercise. Now, mind you, this is a loud family and we're all talking over one another, but I just want you to understand, yes, this is going to be challenging. Preface everything you try to start doing with your learners with the notion that we are all learning together. Break down that apprehension by just helping people understand that um, this is a new world for everyone. So I'm learning with you on how to do this. So be kind to yourself, be kind to me as I'm trying to uh, use this new technology. And again, messaging tools, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these tend to be the ones that are most familiar. I am gonna show you one messaging tool in particular because it is the one that we feel is most commonly used um, and it is something that uh, you have plenty of teachers around you <coughs> that can help support using it. Uh, so Remind is a tool that allows you to set up classes and it allows you to uh, set up messengers. Now I don't have a class per se um, I've been playing around with it because this is probably going to be a tool that I use for a professional development and learning community that we're doing at Crowded Learning uh, focused on creating free resources that we ultimately can share out with everybody. Um, so I have one student, which is actually myself from a different account in here, but this is the interface. If I want to create a class, um, just like Google Classroom, I can create a class name and then I can share out a class code so students can join themselves. Um, or I can upload users into my class or add them here um, by clicking add people and either adding their name, their phone, and their email uh, or uploading a, a, a file that has that information in it if I want to do a bulk upload of folks. So 
Uh, I know some of you are challenged. You said it like I, I don't have their phone numbers. We don't have their emails. Um, so that is going to be a challenge that uh, tracking down that information for all students. But uh, just the way this works on a very quick level, I can simply click on here to create a new message. I select either the class or the people, individual people that I want to share with. And then I click create. <coughs> and I'm going to say, hey, check out this wakelet. Or you could be like, hey, check out this video that is all about a certain concept that students need to learn. So I'm gonna go back to my Wakelet, I'm gonna grab this link, and then I'm gonna go back to Remind, and I'm going to um, paste the link in this message. And then I'm going to click Send. And so uh, what you will see happens, and I'll actually uh, turn on my video for a second, is uh, up top of my notifications, you're gonna see that I have a new notification from Remind. And on my phone, um, on the Remind app, I have a text message that has that information that allows me to actually respond and say that I like it or don't like it um, and a link that I can join it. So uh, Remind is a very great tool for allowing you to send out assignments and a text or just, or just notifications. Like, hey, we're gonna meet on Thursday, open office hours on Thursday, or hey, I'm gonna teach a lesson in Zoom on this, on, on this particular day. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, a question that Kevin popped out. Uh, Zoom has a breakout room feature, but do WebEx, Google Hangouts, and Skype have a similar feature? I'm guessing uh, WebEx probably does. Google Hangouts and Skype probably do not. So breakout rooms means that you can actually start here and then we can open up other rooms. I don't even know how to do that. Like that's Zoom advanced. Um, so I really don't necessarily wanna say that that's the best way for you to go about um, jumping into Zoom and thinking about having breakout rooms. But breakout rooms are nice because you could actually provide differentiated rooms for students to work on and you can check into both rooms as if you wanted them all to be live. Um, <clears throat> Kevin also has a thing, a uh, comment I'm guessing from someone else, the latest news stories are saying that Zoom is getting hacked, but is there a webinar service that is maybe safer than the other? I don't know. Um, I have a whole session on uh, just talking about privacy. Um, you're gonna have these issues with anyone. I can tell you Zoom is owned by a Chinese company uh, and they, uh, they do track, and I think they have every, everything that's ever said anywhere. I don't know if they're doing anything with that. Um, that is the reality of the internet. Um, Google Classroom, you know, I promote Google Classroom, but at the same time, we know that there's privacy issues around Google, around Facebook, all of these tools. Um, the thing is, if a tool is free, uh, you are likely selling your data um, in, in, the, in the most place for some of these lar larger companies. Um, that's, that's, that's the free part about it, is they're getting your, your data in some way, shape, or form. So um, yeah, I, I, I could really go into detail on this. Uh, I'm not going to, but that, that is something to be aware of uh, upfront as we're talking about these various tools. Tools designed for education, like Blocks Builder, or excuse me, like Blocks Builders, uh, like Remind. Um, and even Google Classroom. Google Classroom, because it is used in K-12, they have all sorts of privacy things that they need to make sure that they are not violating uh, per the Department of Education and federal law. So you are a little bit safer in those environments because they are designed for education. Zoom doesn't necessarily have those things in place. And, and, and this is one of those areas where it's like, we're all jumping on a technology because we need to, but we're not necessarily thinking about the ramifications of what that means. So, and that's technology in general. So I think very soon you're going to see issues around some of these and that they're going to have to, if they want to be used in a classroom environment, they're gonna to have to provide assurances that they are safe, that they're not sharing data or gathering data in any sort of way. I just don't know if that's the case right now on these tools because they are geared more towards business and not towards education. So I hope that answers the question. Um, do, 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 where were we? Right, okay, so that was Remind. I just showed you Remind. Um, and just one last thing as we finish off talking about communication and dive into content tools. 
Um, you need to think about upfront, in addition to learner access, in addition to learner skill levels, in addition to your comfort levels, how do you really want to be teaching? And this was the goals of communication that I mentioned earlier. The beauty of teaching online is the fact that you don't all have to be in one place at the same time. Um, and so thinking about what immediacy do you want in terms of both communication, in terms of student work, um, this is a nice guide uh, that is really from an article that talks about why low bandwidth is great because it opens up more avenues for more people. Um, so if you're doing a Zoom meeting, like as we're doing right now, I have to be here. This is immediate. I'm here. You have to be here. Um, and it is high bandwidth. So this does take up a lot of bandwidth in order to be running this Zoom meeting, particularly if you're using video. Again, if students are just calling in, that's a phone call. So that's a little different. <coughs> um, so you do need to think about that. On the very low end of this is low bandwidth, low frequency. So maybe you're using Google Classroom, which is going to, students can access it and it's pretty low bandwidth or you can send emails even if you don't wanna use that. Here is a link to an assignment I want you to do. In your reply, I want you to write two sentences about what you learned. That is as low bandwidth as you can get. Um, they do have to obviously have internet access and do have email on their phone or their computer. Um, however, uh, you need to think about both the frequency in terms of how active you realistically can be, and more importantly, how active and your learners can be, given their lives are so disruptive, disrupted at the moment. And then also in considering access, think about um, you know, what is their bandwidth? Is this going to suck up all of their data for the month? So is that really an appropriate thing for me to ask them to use? Or do I wanna do collaborative chat messaging through something like Remind that is not gonna be sucking up a lot of, of their, um, um, uh, their, data, their data plans, which was a concern that a few of you actually made. <clears throat> so now I'm going to jump into, I forgot that I still have my video on. I'm gonna stop my video, speaking of bandwidth. Um, and those same things apply in terms of bandwidth uh, to the content that you want to use. But in addition to your involvement, as I kept that same kind of matrix here, left to right, I want you to think about what's realistic for you in terms of what you can do now, which might just be getting things out there in the hands of learners that they can, they can sort of self-guide themselves and do something um, in the absence of, of having necessarily set times and set communication plans. Or do I want to be now, or at least in the future maybe, um, having more, you know, assignment based, I'm sending something out, students have to do it and have a start and end date. Um, so the t a lot of these tools you're going to see on the teacher tools page on the Crowded Learning website, but I want to sort of frame them from the standpoint of how involved do you need to be in order for students to use these and what level of agency do students have to sort of self explore. So in the top left quadrant, we're looking at things that are low investment in terms of uh, the teacher having to do anything on a regular basis and learners have sort of full ability to access these at any time and to learn on their own. <clears throat> so um, we have GCF Learn Free, which is a, uh, a free, these are, again, these are all free, very focused on digital literacy skills. Um, it's in English and Spanish and Portuguese. And again, a lot of these lessons uh, allow students to develop the skills they need uh, for digital skills. Reading Skills for Today's Adults is a open, uh, openly licensed leveled library that really begins at early, early ABE levels. There's 348 stories in there. Um, and each reading has recordings so students can practice their fluency skills. Those recordings are at different speeds. The first recording is at the word by word level. So the first recording would be, hi, my name is Jeff. Sorry, that was actually too fast. Hi, my name is Jeff, word by word. The second recording is at a slightly faster speed where it chunks the text uh, in the narration. So it would be, hi, my name is Jeff. So it's acknowledging where those pauses happen and where you chunk text. And then the third reading is done at sort of full speed fluency with proper intonation and prosody. Um, so students can hear them, it's mobile friendly, 
and um, they have access to about 350 readings. Learning Chocolate is a vocabulary tool for ESL students. We will look at that a little bit in a, in a moment. <coughs> I've seen it very widely used in Chicago um, at uh, schools that, that, that have uh, worked with ESL populations. Um, it's all vocabulary based. It's very much audio based where students can hear the words. Um, there's dictation activities, there's spelling activities, there's matching activities where it's having them really with the different sort of uh, receptive and productive language. Um, they are actually practicing with new word sets. USA Learn is a um, learning, uh, excuse me, language learning and a citizenship platform. Um, this is the only one of these where there are student accounts. Uh, the student can create their own account independently. A teacher can create an account for a student. The student does not have to be in that teacher's account, um, but the teacher can bring that student into their account. Um, but once the student is in, uh, the student can work through assignments in any order they wish. And then math is fun. We'll look at that in a second. Um, this is just a treasure trove of just quick articles, lessons, uh, interactives on any math concept you can imagine. It's sort of a dictionary, if you will, of math concepts that you can search and then find lessons and activities around those resources. Now, if you <clears throat> want to have the learner provided with a little bit more guidance, but it's still not something that you plan on assigning every single day, this is a math program and a reading program that both have initial assessments that students take to level them, and then it's all sort of guided for them. So in read theory, students are given new readings as often as they want that are lexiled based on how they have performed up to that point. So if they keep doing well on the questions, there's five comprehension questions after each uh, reading, they're gonna continue to go up in lexile level and level of complexity of text. If they're having challenges, they, can go, they will go down. Um, it has reporting for the student and for the teacher. We will look at that at, towards the end. Ed Ready is a openly, it's a free tool that's math focused. It is a little bit higher level, like ASE level, maybe high intermediate level. Um, students also take an intake assessment and it levels them. And then once they've done that, uh, they are dished lesson after lesson based on um, where they are. It's, it's, it's slightly adaptive, but again, low instructor involvement in terms of having to do anything, but there's limited learner agency. So they can't, as in math is fun, just sort of go to whatever lesson they want. On the right side of the spectrum, when we're looking at uh, content resources, and many of these may be familiar with you, <coughs> that probably require a little bit of instructor involvement, but do allow for learners to sort of explore at will. These in the top right quadrant all do that. So Khan Academy is by far the most widely used of the free and open education resources that we see within adult education. Um, a challenge that we have heard repeatedly with Khan Academy is that students do not know where to go. So it's very unlikely that you'll be able to set students up with a Khan Academy account, excuse me, and then just say, go learn. Um, you will need to point them specifically to the lessons that they need to be working on. But again, it's widely used and there's a reason for that. Math Antics, these are all videos that again, a student would not self-explore, but very popular with adult educators. <coughs> They're a lot more comprehensive than Khan Academy videos. They have a lot more visuals that show sort of the math concepts being taught. Um, but again, students self-exploring in math antics, probably not a great idea. CK12, we'll look at in a bit as well. These are resource sets that have uh, videos and uh, lesson readings and activities and other things all around a single concept bundled in one place. Um, again, probably requires teacher assignment. And then Common Lit is a leveled reading program that is excellent. It is, to me, the best of the best in terms of leveled reading programs uh, that can be used within adult ed um, because it's both the comprehensiveness of the resources, but also just it's very interactive. It has formative assessments um, in there as they read. It has guided reading mode. It has audio. It, you can download the readings and print them out. Um, so all of those are things um, that, that make it, to me, uh, highly usable. However, you do have to assign those readings to students for the most part. And then finally, ReadWorks is also a leveled reading library, very similar to um, 
uh, Common Lit, but uh, whereas in Common Lit, students can actually explore some readings on their own. Uh, ReadWorks, it's pretty much locked down, like every reading a student does has to be um, assigned to them. I do see some questions, but before I leave this slide, a couple things to note. Um, GCF Learn Free, one thing that's nice, all of these can be printed. Uh, Read Theory, Common Lit, and Read Works, all three of the um, reading programs, they all uh, have the ability for you to download and print those um, articles. So say you don't want to bother with setting up students in accounts in those, but you want to provide them with readings, you can do that. You can download a Common Lit reading, you could share it through Remind, you could share it through Google Classroom or uh, um, other things, <coughs> excuse me, and then it's sort of low bandwidth, it would just be a PDF that they're reading, um, however, and with comprehension questions, and then it'll be up to you to decide how you wanna uh, do the comprehension questions. Um, oh, sorry, I promised that I was gonna look at the questions that have been posted by Kevin, so. Uh, so some of these tools, uh, and I run into this problem as well. So this is a question about someone trying to set up a class on Remind on her computer, and she probably, it sounds like, already had an account somewhere else. I actually have that problem with a number of tools because I experiment with them, and I use my crowded learning account, and then I decide, oh, I want to use my personal account, uh, or I use both, and so um, it... Uh, it can be challenging. So like knowing where you are for one thing and you might need to actually create new accounts if you already have an account and can't retrieve uh, what you need to in any of these tools. So in Classroom, I ran into this challenge yesterday. I was trying to make sure I could even do what we're doing today here where everyone is in here right now. Um, I have multiple Gmail accounts. And so I have a Google Classroom for my personal Gmail account. I also have a, uh, a Google Classroom where I am a student in this class in my personal email. And I also have one for my crowded learning account, which is how I'm managing this uh, Google Classroom right now. So if, if you have multiple emails in there, you, you might need to sort of either reset your account or reset your passwords in something like Remind. Um, because that, that's gonna be a problem if you've got either multiple accounts or if you've used different emails in the past. I tend to use for the, the things that I'm pretending to be a teacher in, I use my crowded learning account. And for the things that I'm pretending to be a student in, I use my personal account. Um, and that way, I sort of separate those things out. <coughs> um, all right, so now we're gonna dive into the tools, the learning tools on the teacher website. So again, in the Wakelet that I will, uh, I keep sharing this out in here in the chat just in case. Um, so if you don't have this open in a tab, here is the Wakelet that I'm referring to. Uh, the second thing are these teacher tools. So I'm gonna go back to that crowded learning teacher tools page. And just because I don't want my computer to get slow, I'm gonna close a number of these things that I have open. So we're now getting into content tools. So this is going to be like the guy that came in the apothecary into towns in the early 20th century and was selling all of these things. Um, this is going to be rapid fire, me walking through a bunch of different content. Um, for the math content, I'm, I'm gonna mention a few of these things, but I'm gonna jump into a tool that Crowded Learning has created uh, that will be helpful for a number of the tools that are in here for you to find content that is useful to you. But um, some of the resources that are in here, I've already mentioned Ed Ready. I've, already, I've not mentioned School Yourself. School Yourself is there are modules that students can go to and there's a narrator that's sort of walking through concepts. It constantly stops and has them answer questions. And if they don't answer that question correctly, it's, or, or they do answer it correctly, it's going to point them in different directions. It is a very interesting tool because it's, it is close to us having a real instructor there working with you, as I've seen in an online environment, uh, in the instruction portion, right? You'll see in EdReady, as I said, students like take work through uh, lessons and they take an assessment and then it's gonna go up and down based on how they did. 
School Yourself actually does that up and down within the lesson. Um, so it's kind of an interesting tool that you might want to check out. It is for uh, intermediate and um, like high intermediate, I would say, and ASC levels of math. Um, USA Learns, I mentioned, and then I'm going to do a lightning round of walking through these reading resources. Uh, but first, I want to show you uh, these three math resources, but I'm going to do that through a tool that Crowded Learning has created called Skillblocks. So I'm going to go over here. Skillblocks is a tool based on learning from educators about what their challenges are with using free resources <clears throat> that we have created to make it easier for you to find lessons and activities that align to the skills that you teach. I have given two webinars this week on it. They were both an hour long and that was far too short. Um, but I am going to give you the turbo version so you can see what Skillblocks is. I'm going to also point out that on the Skillblocks page, which you, if you are in Teacher Tools on Crowded Learning site, you have a link here as well in the menu to Skillblocks. These webinars are over. Next week are two more webinars that are gonna get a little bit more in depth, but we will provide overviews of the basics in those webinars, but you're gonna get a turbo lightning round of that here today. Um, I'm gonna log in, and this is also free. And I'm actually going to delete uh, one that I just created because I'm going to share with you uh, how this works. So Skillblocks allows you to search by skill. Um, so it's like, I need to teach X skill. And it's organized by the College and Career Readiness Standards, which may or may not mean anything to you in terms of these levels. But these are exactly the standards that uh, the TAPE test uses, as well as the CASAS, at least the CASAS test for ABE, ASE. Um, and it is the, it's the standards that those tests have to align to. Right now, we only have a, a CCRS filter. <clears throat> in the very near future, we will be adding in a TABE filter. We're waiting for TABE's final sort of wording on all of their sub-skills. And what that will allow you to do is instead of seeing CCRS levels A, B, C, D, E, you'll be able to click on TABE and see levels L, E, M, D, and A. And then again, you'll be able to uh, also search within the skills to the exact skills that you see on a student score report. Um, the new score report has more detail in terms of the specific skills that students either know or need to work on. And that will be the level that you'll be able to search in here. But I'm gonna just very quickly show you how to search for skills and how to create skill blocks. Um, Tab level M is the equivalent of CCRS level C. I'm gonna to go to geometry. These are the substandards in the college and career standards. Uh, when we have a tape filter, it will be those tape skills. When I click on one of these, it is going to pull all of the free and open education resources that are in the library that align to that particular lesson, or excuse me, this particular skill. I can add multiple skills in one place and what you'll see is this is that first skill and then this is that second skill <clears throat> but i'm going to deselect that we'll just focus on one and i am going to say that this skill block uh the standard that this aligns to is lines segments line rays angles all this stuff i'm just going to actually focus on angles so i'm going to select just the resources in here that focus on angles And there's a lot. Um, those are selected. I click save. And then I'm going to call this all about angles. So. so now I've literally pulled together a bunch of free resources. Math is fun is our lesson based resources. Um, uh, Khan Academy is obviously videos. Uh, these are the links to the uh, the assessments, uh, the practice sets in Khan Academy. I can rearrange these, so I might actually want to have the um, these lessons uh, sort of fall in some sort of order, so I just simply drag and move them, and I can do that. So say I want to focus, sorry, my, I've got things in my way. Um, there we go, move that. And maybe I want to put all my acute 
activities together and then obtuse activities together and, and have it be in some semblance of order. I'm not going to go through that trouble right now. Once I've created this, it's done. Um, it's, I'm getting a note saying my internet connection is unstable, so I apologize if my um, audio breaks in and out at any point. Um, I see something in the chat. I just want to make sure that's not that. Oh yeah, uh, Kevin just reminded me, um, as you're learning about these things, please do take note of the things that are of particular interest to you. So uh, this is a listing of resources that all align to this standard um, for G1. Uh, this one actually also relates to a measurement standard. Um, so you know, geometry and measurement are very interrelated, so we see how that aligns. So what I've done now is created a skill block. I could use this as my um, solely as my tool for organizing resources so that I see what is there and then I can use this to click on say um, we're going to look at obtuse angles and every single one of these resources has this copy icon so I'm going to copy it and now that URL has been copied to my clipboard now I'm going to go into our Google Classroom and I'm going to show you how to create an assignment in Google Classroom <clears throat> so I have, this is my classwork right now. I have one assignment that was assigned to everyone. So actually, I think all of you have had it assigned um, if you're in Google Classroom. So this might be an assignment that already shows up for you, but I'm going to create a new assignment. Here's my new assignment. And I'm going to call it obtuse angles. And the instructions are going to be um, go to the math is fun lesson then complete the um, questions at the end report how you did on the google form now you could literally just have them you say hey i want you to um comment back to me what this assignment is but i'm going to add first that link that i just copied and here's that activity and then i've created in my google drive which is linked to this account excuse me um a a form that i have been using with some of my teachers here in chicago excuse me in illinois um, to engage learners in self-reporting their work outside of class. So in the absence of a Khan Academy that they can create an account and you can create a class, a tool like Math is Fun, there are no student accounts. So it's just a free resource that students can explore. So in the absence of having an account, I'm going to um, add this form to this assignment. And so my instructions have been go to the Math is Fun lesson, um, and and complete the lesson um, read the lesson then complete the questions at the end report how you did on the google form so that's my assignment you see i can wait it i can send it to specific students or to all students it's going to all students close that out i can set a due date if i want um, i will set one for this i want this by saturday everyone so please Get it done. Um, and I can sort it into a topic. And that's really important if you're using Google Classroom. It is very important for you to think about organizing things so that things don't get unruly. So this is an assignment that I'm putting in my intermediate math topic. You can even add a, a rubric. <coughs> so all of this has been created. And now I am going to, Sorry, all students. I think I accidentally deselected it. Now I'm going to assign this. So now you are going to get a notification in Google Classroom that this assignment has been created. I'm going to show you something that's just interesting from the assignment that I created uh, earlier. So this was the properties of two-dimensional figures. I used sort of the same concept um, from earlier. And I don't know why this says draft. Oh, here we go. Sorry, I had created something different. I created a geometry lesson earlier. Um, those are my drafts that I was looking at. So I can view the assignment. This was done in the morning webinar. Um, 
think my internet is trying to challenge me right now. Here we go. Um, and so you will see that uh, these are the students that have submitted their resources, the, the assignment, and I can scroll through them. So it's a number of students have done so. Um, and then these are all the students on the left here that I can um, scroll through to see who has submitted, who has not. I wanted to point out one student in particular. I think this is him. Sorry, who actually um, did a screenshot. I'm sorry, my internet's really bad right now. Here we go, this gentleman. Um, so he not only uh, completed it and basically, and I've communicated with him on this, but um, he actually uploaded an image that showed his score um, at the end. So this, this is what he submitted. And so we'll see, he actually took a screenshot. I don't know if he took a screenshot or just took a picture with his phone, but he was able to do that. So he's providing verification to me that I did complete this lesson. His lesson was acute angles and it shows how he did. Um, and then he posted a comment, a private comment to me. This is a great activity. I scored hundred um, percent. And so he did this activity and, and submitted that the form that I attached to the lesson that I just shared to you and to everyone actually, even from this morning is what is basically a student self reporting form. And that might allow students to actually, um, uh, excuse me, uh, report their work, report the number of minutes that they, uh, they took to complete it. And actually, I'm going to go back into here, sorry, um, because I, some students have been using that, and I'll, I'll get there in a second. But it is a way within the assignment, if you are using these loose resources, to maybe condition learners to use the same form every single time to say, this is what I did, this is how long it took me to do it, um, here's what I learned, just to say in a few sentences what they learned, and to maybe rate uh, what, how they felt the activity went for them. So that's something that you could do and provide for students for self-reporting because that is um, do, 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 uh, what is asked for um, in terms, oh, that's when what's asked for, sorry, I'm looking at chat at the same time, uh, that people have been asking for in terms of these resources are great, but does it track student time? So is closed captioning available in Google Meet? Um, I would assume closed captioning is. Um, I'm gonna show you something in a second that I forgot to show in this morning's. Does Skillbox have RLA content? No, Skillbox is just math right now. We have literally just put it out so we can start seeing how students and teachers are using it. Um, that will, is the next step in terms of pulling in um, uh, reading and language arts content. <clears throat> is there any CCRS standards that are not in skill blocks? All of the CCRS standards are in skill blocks. So I'm not sure what that question is referring to. Uh, the question about closed captioning, which is really important. Uh, Zoom does offer closed captioning. I have never used it. I take the videos that I create, I save those videos, and then I add closed captioning afterwards. But I wanted to show you something. I mean, this is why I assume Google, Google Meet does, and most of these do, just because of accessibility concerns. But say you wanted to present and use slideshows with your students, like I'm doing right now. Um, you can see this toolbar that you have in Google Slides. Now I want you to watch. I'm gonna click on closed captions right here. So when I click on closed captions, you're going to see that it is repeating every single word that I say in the bottom of your screen. And it is really, really accurate. The one thing that it doesn't do is punctuate as I'm talking. So this is just continuous text that you are seeing. But I will say that what it does do a very good job of is picking up on the words that I'm saying. Now, obviously, because I'm trying to allow this to close caption, I am talking very clearly. Uh, one of the slides that I will really just glaze over in the last half hour here is uh, I do a session talking about how you can use tech tools to practice fluency. So uh, your students have a recording app on their phone. Doesn't matter if it's Android, excuse me, Android or if it's an iPhone. 
they have the ability to record themselves as they're reading something and play it back. That's great for them to be able to hear what they're saying. Um, they could also use something, you could literally put a reading passage in Google Slides and have them push it live like I'm, I see the same thing you're seeing right now, click the closed captioning button, and then practice reading into uh, the, the microphone on their computer uh, or, or other tools. And if they're not properly intonating, the translation that you see here is not going to be that accurate. So um, this is a pretty cool tool. It's obviously necessary for accessibility things. Um, again, I just tend to do that in post um, production. That can get annoying because I'm looking at the screen and I'm seeing the words that I'm saying all at once. So that can be a bit challenging. Um, but yes, they uh, do have uh, closed captioning tools. I didn't mean to pop on that. What I meant to do is get back in and escape. Um, so I wanna go back to the uh, skill blocks. So just a couple other things that I can show you real quickly. If you want to share, so that what I just showed you was sharing a specific activity in skill blocks. So that's you using this as a resource sort of organizational tool, finding things and being able to share them out with students, um, specific activities and asking them to do something. I could also share this entire skill block. Now I wouldn't do that until I've organized it in a manner that makes sense, but this essentially becomes a playlist of activities that students can do to learn about angles. <clears throat> All I need to do to do that is to copy this um, access code, which I'm going to do right now, and I'm going to go back. You're going to see all the different skill blocks that I've created and the various access codes. And then I'm going to log out here for a second and uh, see what a student sees. So students do not have accounts. We very intentionally do not have accounts right now because we're trying to figure out, again, how folks are wanting to use this tool. All they have to do is go to skillblocks.org and then enter that passcode that you provide them, and then boom, they are in this skill block. And so then they have the ability to launch these things. Um, it, all of these resources are mobile friendly as well. <coughs> and so you have the ability to um, you know, share these things with students and be assured that if they have a mobile device, they'll be able to access them. One other thing that I just wanna show you in skill blocks that you may have seen and it's probably not all that important to you right now because your learners actually don't have the books that you have in class. But Skillblocks allows you to manage a library, which means that you can search for uh, print resources that you have access to in your classroom and add them to your library. So we've partnered with Paxson and um, New Readers Press and McGraw-Hill and they've provided their alignments to the college and career readiness standards as well. So if you have these books in your classroom, all you have to do is go to add print resources. And I'm just going to go to something because I know that it exists, college and career readiness. So here are college and career readiness workbooks from McGraw-Hill. I used to work at McGraw-Hill. All I have to do is click on that book. This is something that, my, that I have access to. You're not buying the book. You're not getting access to the book by doing this. You're indicating this is a resource that my students have access to. And so now, any of those resources that I, I have access to, <coughs> here's that skill block I just created with just the free and open resources. If I go to select learning activities, I can add more things in there. And you'll see that from that workbook, there is an activity that focuses on that skill, as well as from some of the other resources that are in my library. So I could add those as well. And again, this may not serve anything for you right now, but when you're back, if this is a tool uh, that you wanna continue using, which I hope it is, um, maybe you want those book lessons to be front and center because those are the lessons that you're using and the resources that you're using as your core curriculum with learners. And then these are just resources that you wanna provide so students have additional practice. Uh, I didn't point out that these stars are just there to provide you with the ability to say, hey, this is required and these are not, um, or you can use them in any way you want, um, but this is Skillbox. <coughs> and so it provides you access to all of these different tools. Um, within Skillbox, 
is, uh, as you saw, math is fun. Um, Khan Academy is in there as well. CK12 is in there as well. Flexbooks is in there as well. And FET, which are interactive simulations that provide conceptual understanding. I want to show you CK12 as a resource real quick because I think it's really great. Um, and actually, sorry, instead of doing that, I'm actually going to go to uh, the skill blocks page on Crowded Learning's website because this also is important. Um, this is a page where you can learn about the webinars that we have ongoing for Crowded Learn uh, for Skill Blocks as well as to launch the tool. But tucked down below here are also all of our standards alignments. So the things that we've put into Skill Blocks to make it do what I just showed you, how what we are doing. Um, you have access to all of the alignments for CK12, uh, for Khan Academy, for Math is Fun, it hasn't popped it up yet, for Common Core Sheets, which is all worksheets that you can download and save or print and share with your students. Um, so if you're really low tech because your students don't have access, these, there's over 5,000 worksheets here that are aligned to the College and Career Readiness Standards and that we provide the TABE levels and the TABE emphasis levels for all of these. Um, again, we know some districts are actually creating packets of work for learners so that they can come pick it up and they have access to things. So if you are needing to be that low tech, um, all of these resources exist for you that are print based. And remember all those reading resources also allow you to print all of the articles. I'm gonna scroll up to <clears throat> CK12 because we have resource alignments for both their content sets as well as a tool called Flexbooks. <clears throat> Again, these will you'll automatically be pointed to, do, to these things in skill blocks if you decide to use it, but if you don't, all of the resource sets in CK12 are in here. And again, we've done that same thing here where we say the tape level and the emphasis level. I'm gonna click on one of these. Not sure if it was the best one. But these are, as I say, resource sets. So included in this, and these you can share with students, you can integrate this with Google Classroom. Um, there's a reading about this concept, which is calculator use with algebraic expressions. So there's a reading about how to use the calculator with algebraic expressions, there's activities, there's practice, um, there's a real world example. A lot of these also have videos and simulations that students can do. But I love this because it's just, here are different activities with different modalities all around this one concept. Um, so this is a great openly licensed resource. Um, and again, we have all of these links here and it is uh, linked into skill block. Flexbooks is also from the CK12 organization, but these are um, kind of online textbooks for grade level equivalency six, seven, and eight, as well as algebra one, geometry, and algebra two. It's taking a second to load, um, but you may wanna just use the book. And again, we have all of the standards alignments in here and the tape emphasis, uh, or you might want to uh, assign these one by one based on what you're working on. So skill blocks would be great for that, but I'm just gonna launch it so you see what a student sees. Um, if you provide this link, either through skill blocks or through some other tool. It's going to bring them directly to the lesson, understanding linear equations. It's going to give them a description of the lesson. It's also going to provide them with information about other ways to learn, including a Khan Academy video and interactive uh, and um, other lessons that they have available. But these lessons in Flexbooks <coughs> are text-based. Um, but they also are, in, they have lots of interactivities embedded in them. So it's usually, this is, this is more than I've ever scrolled down in a lesson that I've looked at, um, where there isn't an interactivity like right up front where the students uh, do something right away. So they have these interactives throughout the lesson where students do something and then answer questions. Um, but it also provides the instruction um, that students need. And then there's a practice set that goes along with it. So you can assign this to your classes. I don't have classes assigned. Um, and you can integrate these lessons. There's an automatic assignment through Google Classroom if you set up an account in CK12. Um, I see nothing in the chat from Kevin, so I am gonna keep going because we do only have 15 minutes left and I wanna get through some of these remaining things. 
my number one goal is to get to uh, the right page because I do have a lot of tabs open. Um, yeah, I'm gonna close that too, sorry. So I'm gonna go back to our teacher tools page. So what have we walked through? We walked through Khan Academy CK12 Flexbooks. I've told you about these. Uh, and we're gonna look at the reading resources real quickly uh, in a second. The rate, way I've divided this up, this is important, is the things under the content of subject area course platforms. These are all things where students create accounts and that way uh, you can manage those students. This way you can also get the recording and the information on what students are doing and how students are doing. So if that is particularly important to you, um, and it, it, it should be, um, these are tools that you can use that are going to allow you to do that. So you can sort of be more on top of things, more managed. Remember that spectrum that I showed you more towards the right side of a little bit more teacher involvement with these resources. And the things under supplemental learning content, these are all sort of um, individual bits and pieces, lessons, activities, and things. There are no logins for these, however, um, they are very uh, comprehensive in terms of content and they might be things that you want to integrate into lessons to augment them. <clears throat> so I want to show you what I talked about earlier, reading skills for today's adults. This is that reading program that has the not only the leveled readings, there's 348 across these 16 levels, um, but they do start at very, very early basic levels. So um, Here's one called Fall is Here. And again, it's called for adults. So the topics are um, money, job and work, family, safety, parenting. Um, there's some, some kind of you know, intense articles in here, but these are all real world topics that adults face. Um, citizenship or others. So this is sort of very basic level. You see these are very short sentences. And again, um, we have these readings at different levels, uh, word by word, chunking, and then full intonation and prosody. You'll see the time amount for each goes down um, as you uh, get uh, more fluent in terms of the audio. Um, there's also a timer that students can click, and then it's going to have a countdown, and they can read this article. You see these numbers to the left. Those are the uh, number of words at that point in the passage. So if you want to get words per minute, if that's important, um, you can do that uh, by using the timer and then seeing where they leave off. Uh, the, the platform, all of these things are also, all the stories are also downloadable, <clears throat> as well as a really great uh, supplement. I didn't show this during the last class because we were way short on time. I am going to show it um, in this class because I think it's really important for you to see. Um, it's not quite fully downloaded yet. Here we go. I'm gonna open it up uh, because these also are Word documents that you could either print out and share if you're really low tech or you could share the Word document with students and have them work through the activities right in the Word document. Now we're gonna have a problem here we go with me actually launching this Word document. So for that story, fall is here. Here are the definitions um, and the words. And then here's a closed paragraph that uses those words. And then here is a fill in the blank set of activities that uses those words. Uh, and then here is a language activity um, that is using adjectives and it's using adjectives and contexts that are based on um, some of the words and concepts that were in the reading. Uh, then it has your turn to fill in the blanks with words that fit these sentences. Then it has speaking activities where students can talk with one another um, and, and fill in these blanks. And so asking the questions and then answering the questions. And then there's an assessment. And then there's also a writing activity with sentence frames for students to write with two different options. Every single story in this library, 348 stories, has this activity sheet that goes along with it. Um, that again, it might be harder right now for you to use in a distance learning environment, but there are ways that you could try to incorporate this in ways, um, having them you know, fill in these blanks in a Word document or, or a Google Doc. Um, but every single one of these lessons has those available. 
<coughs> Sorry, I want to go back to teacher tools. Um, I've already talked about GCF Learn Free. Crash Course is probably more for high school equivalency level students. These are all videos uh, on sort of higher concepts, but uh, US history, government, civics, so a lot of science uh, videos in there and other topics as well. They're very visual, they're very entertaining. Um, they're, they're great, great videos and um, again, more appropriate for higher levels. TV 411 has content in reading and science and math and writing. Um, it's not very organized, but there are some just kind of nice, uh, easy to follow activities and videos that might be of um, help to you. It is an openly licensed resource as well. All four of these resources at the bottom are uh, ESL resources. So I'm gonna click into each one of them really quickly. Uh, this is an open ESL program um, from Canada, University of Victoria. They have a lot of open resources there. And you can see it's broken up into ESL levels. I'll actually go to a higher level, um, just slightly higher, because I think there's more activities in there. So there's grammar activities, reading and listening, and vocabulary. I'll go to the reading. <coughs> Again, it's really for adults. So um, these are human rights stories where they can click on the reading and you'll see there's different exercises that go with each of the readings. There's audio that goes with the reading. Um, so I'm gonna actually go to the reading just so you can see it. So here's the reading with the audio. The story of the and then you can have the assessment where they show one at a time or they show all questions. Um, so this is a really nice resource. Learning Chocolate, I mentioned earlier, is one that I see all over the place in Chicago. Um, so you can see there's a number of different categories of content. I'm actually gonna go to thinking about the fact that um, you know, we're asking students to use technology. So we're gonna go to technology. So uh, you'll see all of these different sets of content that deal with technology. So let's go to internet browsers. And here's an activity on internet browsers, which might be something that your students need to understand. Now you're gonna see a lot of ads pop up. It's really annoying, but I have seen this time and time again. Teachers condition students to just immediately go to this little button and it expands it within the window. And so it's nice and wide, no more ads. Um, you'll see Internet that Explorer. on these main pages, I get to see what these terms are and click on the audio and it's going to say it. And now every single set of words has this same sequence of activities. So the first Create one a new tab. is Create a new tab. Google Chrome. reading and listening. Um, and matching those and they're timed and then they can check their answers. The second activity is the visuals and matching the words. There is no audio, so I have to actually match these uh, based on reading and seeing and labeling basically what I know. The third one is no words. Internet browsers. <coughs> Internet browsers. So again, it's audio and I'm placing um, these icons where they belong in the labeled graphics. And then the fourth one is a fill-in. So at this point, I need to really know these terms. Um, so there is no audio to support me. So it's, it, this is a little bit more challenging when it's something like parts of the body. It's a little bit more realistic. And then the last one is dictation. So this is getting spelling and writing. Create a new tab. So um, they actually type in here. And then again, once I've done all of them, um, let me just do one. I think I can check answers. Yeah. So it's going to grade it and tell them what they got right and wrong. Um, so every single one of the uh, word groups uh, and categories in here, um, and then the subsequent activities within, they all follow this same sequence of activities for students to do. So really popular ESL tool. Again, it's free. Voices of Americans uh, Learning English is what the VOA stands for. And these are all sort of videos in particular. Um, and a lot of them are based on news. And you'll see, you can search by different levels for videos. Um, so they have lessons on particular content and concepts but then they also have nice sets of videos, things called news words. So you might hear um, specific terms in the news and these videos basically uh, start with, you may have heard this term in the news. 
and there'll be a reporter that is doing a news story that uses that word. And then it goes into depth of understanding what that word is. It also gets into, uh, there's word uh, activities that deal with idiomatic phrasing. Um, so these are kind of nice little videos that get into um, English language learning. I don't see, any, I do see a new question, sorry. <coughs> uh, time in skill blocks cannot be recorded. That question has come up a couple of times. It is something I want to do, I do want to address before the end of the hour. Um, when we're talking about using these different resources, uh, we need to think about how you're actually capturing time. So I'm just going to go to the bottom here real quick to point out some uh, tools here that I do want you to be available, uh, know about for assessment. So you may uh, want to have assessments for students. So maybe you're just sharing a video and you want to create an assessment for that. These are all really great tools that you can use to create assessments. What I love about, in particular, everything about Google Forms, Google Forms, you're creating your own. Um, but all of these tools allow you to not just create your own assessments, but to search through assessments that other teachers have created. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And a number of them, they'll put the standards code in there. So if you search by that standards code, you can find assessments in Kahoot and quizzes that all do that. Edpuzzle is a really interesting resource in the um, Wakelet that I shared with you. Oh, I, I didn't add it in. I will add it in. Um, there's a great wakelet in there on the coronavirus. And within that lesson um, on the coronavirus, there's an ed puzzle. Ed puzzle allows you to take a video and then to embed formative assessment questions as students watch the video. So we know students are much more interested in watching videos than reading. Um, so it's a really kind of cool tool that allows you to add assessments into a video. But all of these other ones are really great because they, um, they have different capabilities. Formative actually allows you to upload PDFs and then actually tag the questions um, so that that PDF can be used as the assessment. And then there's like literally it adds like, uh, you know, fill in the answer here um, so that you don't have to create from scratch within the technology tool. So I think that's a really interesting tool. Um, all right, I do want to make sure that we're um, mindful of time. So uh, we're going to fly through these last two content resources and then some sort of parting thoughts. One in particular focused on Kevin's question about um, tracking time. So Quill, as I, uh, I did not point this out, Quill is an interactive grammar and language practice tool. <clears throat> uh, we have done alignments of Quill to all of the college and career writing standards and the TABE language standards. So it has great activities where students can do sentence completion like this. This is combining sentences in this activity. Um, there's lesson plans that you can do whole class instruction where every student is writing the same sentence or completing the same sentence. Uh, most of the activities are either sentence writing where the student reads this and then they type that dog is and use the correct pronoun, a possessive pronoun. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. It's launching me into Quill. Um, and then there's also passage proofreading activities where students go through and based on the concept that they're, that lesson's about, they're proofreading the passage and applying that concept to the passage that they're looking at. Um, what I really love about Quill is as they're editing those passages in particular, every single edit they do, even if it wasn't one that they were supposed to do, they get feedback on whether or not it's correct in the grammatical concept that's being covered. And then they also get a report at the end that shows on various grammar concepts how they did. Um, going to hop again, because I want to be time. I already showed you reading skills for today's adults. Um, within the Wakelet, you're going to see there's a vocabulary resource from Appalachian State University. These are all downloadable activities that are Word documents for using Tier 2 vocabulary. We have taken all of those uh, lessons and added Quizlets to them so that students can get interactive practice with the vocabulary. There's five lessons per, um, per reading. Um, I'm not going to go into detail in this slide deck. You have detailed information about a lot of these resources, so please do look at it. 
Um, I do want to point out one thing that is available to you and it is linked in the wakelet. <clears throat> As part of a reading professional development series we did last year, we looked at some of these tools. Um, Common Lit, Read Theory, and ReadWorks, those are those three leveled reading libraries that I talked about. This is a shared document that you have access to where teachers have provided their input um, on content and usability considerations for each of these. So if you're thinking about reading resources that you want to use with students, this is a great place to go to because adult educators have provided their input on each of these tools, both in terms of what kinds of texts are in there and how they use it with their learners. So uh, it's a really good resource. Uh, lots of details in here about how to use the various reading tools, but both Common Lit uh, and Read Theory, I wanna point something out about Read Theory, which is the one where you just set students up and then it, it lexiles them according to their performance. So the students answer questions on these passages. You'll see um, that at the end, they uh, get our, uh, information about how they did. So I did this myself. I intentionally did not answer two questions correctly because I wanted to see what the report looks like. So the report for the student shows them their grade level progression and also their lexile level as they're making their way through passages. More importantly, it also shows you and the student how they performed based on the college and career readiness standards uh, um, and TAVE domains. So the two questions I got wrong were focused on the concept or the, the skill of key idea and details. So you can see that my performance in those questions has been less than on craft and structure and on integration of knowledge and ideas. So it's kind of really uh, interesting um, information in terms of how it's organized for you. In terms of how you share content, this will definitely be a deep, deeper dive uh, webinar that we do in the near future. Again, you need to think about how is it that you want learners to be working? Do you want it to be, do you want to be in control and you're only creating assignments like what I did over the course of this session where I provided that um, math is fun activity and I assigned it to you in a Google Classroom assignment? Or do you want to maybe message them out like I showed you with that wakelet where you just text it out on your mind and say, hey, these might be some great things for you to look at this week. Um, or do you want to organize your content in a way that students can access it at any time and use something like Math is Fun um, or like the resources that I've compiled in Wakelet where that's for you to access and go to anytime, anywhere. I'm not creating assignments for you, but you have this Wakelet now and these are resources that you can go to at any time. You could build a Wakelet that has math resources that students can be using, Khan Academy, CK12, Math is fun, right? And then that is a single link that they can always go to um, to be working on math. So how you sort of want to organize content for students is an upfront consideration that you want to make. Um, this is that coronavirus uh, wakelet activity that I, um, I showed you uh, or was talking about earlier. So this is if you're using wakelet and you want to actually create a full lesson in wakelet. Here's a great example. This is Ashley, she's a great friend of mine. She is a tech geek like no one's ever met. So she uses a bunch of apps and pulls them into a Wakelet so she can have students doing a KWL chart and have students doing an Ed Puzzle video and all sorts of things. And then completing something at the end to verify that they've done all the work. Um, in terms of tracking learner progress, so this was the one question I wanted to make sure we answer at the end. <laughs> Learning management platforms allow you to track learner progress, um, as do some of these uh, tools such as Khan Academy. Um, if you want to be doing more lesson-based things, if you're using Zoom, then students are in that Zoom for an hour, you have that report, so you know that that student was learning for an hour because you have that data. Um, if you're using something like proficiency-based lessons where you're providing activities and you want them to just share what did you learn, it's going to be up to you to gauge how long that takes. This is called teacher verification, and this varies from state to state. So um, that's going to be up to you in terms of, of sort of how you're doing that. Quiz tools always al also allow you to do that, so like Quizlet and others, but you don't get that reporting necessarily as a teacher. Uh, many of them you can create classes. Um, and so you would get that reporting on how they're doing on quizzes, 
Um, but you know, you need to think about how many things you want to be managing at once. Remember that question was asked earlier. So do I really want to have to log into quizzes to get that reporting and log into Google Classroom to get that reporting and log into Khan Academy to get that reporting? That can get unwieldy. Um, so you want to really think about what is the most manageable way for you to track learner progress right now. I am advocating heavily for student self-reporting um, because if you create a form like this and the activity that I shared with you has this form in it so you can see, um, this allows learners to just quickly answer some questions. Um, one form that they use all the time, they can say, hey, this is the lesson that I did, sorry, um, this is the URL, this is how long it took me, um, this is what I learned, and this is how easy it was uh, for me or hard for me it was. And they can also upload an image if they want to take a screen cap like I showed you of the quiz so that you have verification of that. This isn't necessarily allowed when it comes to distance learning and proxy hours. But right now we are in a state where it's kind of wild west and people are wanting to put whatever they can in front of learners. So I think this could be a very effective way of going about doing that. And all they need to know how to do is use forms. And then you can literally share a video with them and then have them complete a form saying, what did you learn? Um, at least you're getting sort of some sort of activity and you're teaching students to sort of manage their time, document their time in terms of how much they're learning. And ultimately, um, this has them thinking about what kinds of resources do I want to work on and what can help me learn. So along those lines, tomorrow, and this is, um, again, this link is in here. I actually will link this into Google Classroom again. Uh, World Education, the EdTech Center, is doing a series of strategy sessions with folks on basically how to, um, how to set up distance learning in, in a sort of rapid fire way as we're trying to do right now. Tomorrow's webinar, which is at 1 p.m. Eastern, is specifically on this teacher verification model. And there will be teachers from New Hampshire who talk about how they have for the past year and a half um, had students using kind of whatever apps they want or specific apps that they've told them to use that don't track time normally, but that students have the responsibility of indicating what lessons they've done and indicating how much time they've spent doing it. And what's nice about that is if, say you assign the same resource to 10 students, and the 10 students report that time, you can take an average of those times and then suddenly that's gonna be your guide for future assignments with that particular resource that otherwise doesn't have uh, time reporting as you use it. So the way these are structured is there's like 10 minute lightning talks on different topics and then there's breakout rooms for you to go into as was a question that was mentioned earlier to talk more in depth with the folks who presented on uh, their particular strategy. Um, I am going to share out a quiz <coughs> afterwards so you can see how Quizzes works. Um, quizzes is my favorite of the assessment tools because not only can you assign quizzes as homework, but you can also actually do game mode. So we could all be in this quizzes together um, and in doing so, uh, it acts like a game where we're in real time answering and then students are getting points based on how fast they answer and then there's a winner. Uh, in terms of who gained the most points, both through correct answers and the speed with which they answered. So it's kind of a fun tool, both for virtual um, and classroom. Finally, sorry we've gone 10 minutes over. I thought I'd actually be better the second time around, but I guess I got a little bit more wordy the second time around. Um, in terms of what's next for you, we are gonna be taking all of your questions and all of the chat things from both this morning session and the session that we're in now and using that to guide our questions that we send out in a follow-up survey. And that survey is going to be looking specifically at what tools and strategies are, are you most interested in learning more about in follow-up webinars. So that's going to be step one. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing in the near future is providing you, and it'll be through email, it'll also be through the Google Classroom, um, I don't know if we'll continue using the Google Classroom, but um, it's there right now, so we might as well use it. Um, with the implementation plan, we are going to uh, create a template for you that allows you to, again, think about a lot of the things that we've talked about today in terms of considerations. We'll have sort of guided questions for you to answer, to think about as you um, look at these various tools and strategize for how am I going to be 
communicating with my learners? How am I going to be providing learning content and instructions to, to my learners? How am I going to be um, sort of tracking learners using these various assessment tools and management tools that you have available to you? Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, we are at the end. So I just want to say um, there was a lot covered in this uh, two hour session. I hope you found it helpful. Um, I know it was a, a lot of things, but hopefully there are one or two tools that you sort of in particular found interesting that you are going to explore more. Again, I will, um, I'll send a link to this again, but this wakelet is something that I will continuously update um, with some things that I realized over the course of even this presentation I forgot to add. So this is a great resource for you, um, both to explore tools. I provided that link to learn about leveled readers. I provided a link to skill blocks. I provided a link to the digital skills library um, that Crowded Learning has. There's a link to that Zoom conferencing, or excuse me, the conferencing tools tutorial that that teacher provided with the all uh, four tools that she walks through. Um, and there's great uh, sort of links here that allow you to explore ed tech reviews of pretty much any of the tools that were shared during today's session. So there's a lot of resources in here for you to continue learning beyond this, but uh, be uh, assured that in very uh, fast succession, we are going to be providing more learning opportunities to you in specific areas based on the things that you're interested in. So um, with that, I want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your commitment to your learners. And again, uh, this is awkward times for all of us. So uh, know that you're not going to be able to do everything all at once. So be mindful of that and be mindful of your learners. And uh, we, will, we will work through this together. Um, thank you and take care.